So it's the uh, 22nd of April 2013. We're here interviewing Jackie Cooper and Haig Beck and Stratford Islands, and interviewing you as Andrew Steen, Robert Trudell, and myself, Fanny Nagelsaya. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I suppose uh, to start, I thought we might go outside the, that other project's time period and probably right at the end of my time period and talk a little bit about the language of postmodern architecture which you were both involved in obviously and you poured over the manuscripts as I understand it and yes. edited it from back to front. Um, so how? when is it when does it come out? You want to move closer. Uh, 1977 I think. January 77 I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, how was how was the process working with him? Why did it happen or or I mean, for instance, Hay commissioned that. Yes, book. yes, I know that too. And yeah. um, it why did it happen? And why did it happen? Yes. Um, uh, Charlie had been doing his um, PhD at, um, under Rainer Bannum yep. at, um, at the Bartlett, and uh, he had been doing some teaching at the AA, um, and was running seminar programs at the AA. Mm. He had um, just he had Anna Arendt out. Hannah yeah. Arendt, yeah, 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 and um, uh, um, and he did some seminars around her work at the AA, and oh, this I'm really dredging this stuff yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, dred dredging <laughs> this stuff up, uh, and uh, at the same, at about this time, he was also working on um, ideas about um, language and architecture. Yeah, and, um, and he had been working with George Baird, George yeah. Baird, and Nathan Silver, and Nathan Silver. That's right. Um, and um, George Baird and he had done um, a book on anarchism. And Charlie, Charlie was um, was part of a, a small group of us, which consisted of Leo Creer and Rita Creer. And Rem Coolhouse and Maddie Wiesendorf, his wife. And uh, Charlie, was Maggie on the scene then? I think she was. Um, Jackie and me, we were sort of thrown together through the AA. And, um, and when I started editing AD, um, of course you ask, um, you ask your friends to do right yep. to write sure and this is at a moment I mean this is the mid 70s by now you have to remember that from about 73 onwards um, the Brit British economy went into a severe tailspin mm. in the early 70s um, and um, nobody built for almost 10 years mm. um, there was just no work around mm. and so all those there were still people who were still like the grunt group um, which is um, Mike Golden, Jeremy Dixon, Ed Jones, and others. They were doing social housing. They were doing. In they were doing the last of the social housing in, Cam in Camden. There was, there was still some of that going on mm -hmm. in the and then early Milton early seventies, and then they all went up to Milton Keynes because Derek Walker, Walker, had, um, who was very very clever, recognised them for what they were and brought them all up to Milton Keynes. Um, so apart from that, there was basically nothing being built. I mean, Foster and Rogers and the others were doing a house for their mother, <laughs> sort of thing. Right, yeah. <laughs> that was it. And um, and so it was a period of um, of architectural explor exploration, theorising and exploration. Really interesting moment to be in England, mm. in London. And with no work going on, you could ask all these bright young men who had gone through the AA and through the Bartlett, to do to work for you to write for you as, as editor of AD, yeah, and they did, and um, so meanwhile, um, Charlie was um, Charlie had just about got his PhD, and I can remember um, Martin Pauley at that point was doing producing um, a scurrilous um, newspaper weekly newspaper for for, the, for Elvin Boyarsky at the AA called Ghost Dance Times. Um, and the ghost dance is what, um, what the Indians did 
following the customer and the others I thought we would make them bulletproof right <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it sort of made Charlie it sort of made um, um, Martin poorly bulletproof because he managed to produce it for a couple of years and it was really bad naughty naughty um, in his attacks on everyone from Elvin from the, from I mean the hand that fed him yes they got bitten regularly Elvin boy asking but uh, but also he um, he had great fun um, um, having um, attacking Charlie. I can remember when when Charlie got his um, what got his PhD. He, there was an issue of Ghost Dance Time with Dr. Jenks on on the cover. I'm trying to remember what it was, but it was um, um, there was sexual innuendo involved in it. Some fetishism or something or right. like that. that well, was Charlie was writing about fetishism. Yeah, yes. yeah. So, so it wasn't surprising. Yeah. But that's okay. Um, meanwhile, um, Leo was um, Leo Creel was um, was really one of the one of the really authoritative voices coming out of um, out of um, Europe, out of France and um, and um, Belgium, and his brother out of Germany. And um, and he thought he'll never get published. So I can remember I did an issue um, of AD on his work, and um, and that was he said. I remember saying to me at the time, I never thought I'd ever get published in English. <laughs> in yes, but how did? How, no, I'm getting. I'm getting to that. I know I'm getting you are, to that. So I'm getting, <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm, getting, I'm getting to that because you have to understand in this in this scenario um, um, when I finally took full control of AD um, and had split with Martin. Spring, the other editor, uh, on ideological grounds. Um, when I split with Martin Spring, we redesigned the magazine, and I decided I would make it really about um, contemporary architecture as best I could, um, and rather than purely on alternative um, technology, which is the way Martin had been taking it off. And the first issue of uh, I did in this vein was um, an issue on Arata Izazaki mm -hmm. and um, and I asked and I had gone to a, a lecture that uh, Charlie had given at the AA and um, and he in which he was talking about Izazaki and I asked him would he do um, an essay for us and the, he wrote an essay and the essay is called um, it's in here Radical Eclecticism Radical Eclecticism mm -hmm. and here it is this is and uh, the proposition that Charlie was making was that um, that that architecture informed um, as a language, and that uh, one of the one of the things that were missing from modernity was it only informed you about machine a machine age, and uh, and yet architecture could actually take speak ideologically yeah. about other issues, and uh, and that if one could actually um, embrace an eclectic approach to architecture, a radical eclectic approach, as opposed to a Victorian eclectic approach to architecture, um, one could um, introduce radical ideas, ideological propositions. Mm. And uh, the Isazaki and radical eclecticism mm. is an attempt to map out um, this proposition. Mm. Um, and I was uh, thought, up until then, I had been a bit... Uh, really, not terribly convinced by um, the notion of a, um, architecture being a language in that in that literary sense. Yeah. Still not really, um, even more so. Um, however, um, the notion of a radical eclecticism and an ideological perspective rather appealed. Yeah. And I said to Charlie, "Why don't you go and write a book on this? This is a great idea." Because I'd spoken to Papa Duckers and we were thinking that we would produce some AD books and I said to Papa Duckers we'll make this the first AD book so Charlie went off to do the do the winter semester in um, in Los Angeles and um, and he came back in that spring um, and I expected the book to take a year and you know three months later he turns up and says well here's the book and um, and Jackie was given the task of editing it, and of course it, it had it had lost its sense of purpose and direction completely, and bec and morphed into the language of postmodern architecture, yeah. which I thought is rather rubbish, <laughs> and still do. Mm. 
but uh, but it, re it it did actually have a very powerful. Charles point. was interested in taxonomies and classifying mm. architecture and you know hot dog stands and all of this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, not so much, I think, in the Venturian sense of taxonomies and popular architecture, but from a almost a, an art historical perspective. And there's one of the postcards in that pile is of King Kong. And if you read the back of it, he says he's got this great idea for a, for a, for a column in, in AD, which is, let's do the 10 worst buildings of modernism and, mm. and um, how they've, how they've um, they're killing mother architecture and blah, 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 blah. The Nuremberg trials of architecture he wants. To, and, and it's, it's... I was horrified. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, again, it's all to do with, you know, classifying... Yeah. You know whether it's Pruitt, Igo, or whatever it might be, yeah. giving giving it a name, um, and so he was into into really heavily into taxonomy, and mm. I think that's what the language of postmodernism became. Mm. Do you think Rainer Banham had a part in this? Um, Did he encourage that sort of approach? Well, Rainer Banham was an architect; Charlie wasn't. Um, so I think there's a there's a really fundamental difference. From the outset, in in in, in their provenances um, as as academics, I'm not saying that Charlie's approach was invalid. It's mm. just that it but didn't, he, it didn't emerge from architecture. Yeah, and he comes, you know, his background is um, a, a master's um, in English lit. Yeah. So um, so he you know he comes into doing a PhD on architecture. Yeah. From a very only from an American, what I would accept as an American perspective, yeah. that allows you to do that because there's no way in the world that from an Anglo-Saxon approach to making architecture that you could ever come into architecture yeah. that way. So well, I don't, I don't think Bannum was 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 fermenting a sort of postmodern critique. Do you? No, but Bannum was very interested in in the in the subcultures of California. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, as an Englishman, and as a, yeah. an but in, outsider. But in classifying all these different strands, I mean, he went about it in, in a sort of methodical way. And do you think that Jenks sort of carried that on? Or, or I think you could say that because what he was doing was, um, in, in, in many ways, inventing his own taxonomies. They were descriptive by and large. And he was uh, classifying, you know, architecture according to his own lights, and he, he was classifying, I don't even know so much as the tendencies, but at least the stylistic mm. um, uh, salient characteristics. I mean, he was entertaining. Oh, very. And We're talking is. about Charlie now, aren't yeah. we? Charlie, yes. And, yeah. and he had the images to make it entertaining mm. in, in a way that a lot of people lecturing did not. That's true. So... You know, you didn't miss that stuff. Well, I didn't, anyway. Yeah, yeah. No, he was entertaining and he was provocative. But I think I think that Bannum's interest in uh, in the Californian subcultures fed into the position that um, that Charlie had been developing. Um, I mean, they two uh, they found each other appropriately. That's one of the questions I wanted to ask. How do you think that happened? Why would Charles have gone? halfway around the world to study under Bannum. He, he obviously um, had some idea behind that, right? Like, um, Well, that's, that's something you'd have to put to Charlie. Yeah, OK. Yeah. But, but I mean, I don't find it very... I, I don't find it surprising. Right. Because where would you have found somebody in America right. to, to sure. take you in this direction? As yep. it is, he worked with Canadians. Yeah. I think what you, was, you were talking a little bit before about that outsider thing and drawing in um, external discourses into architecture and I think that's kind of the crux of what I'm interested in and in, in a sense Bannum is the flip side of that how he pushes himself into a more strictly architectural um, domain but um, uh, one of my interests is tracing back through um, the PhD he references his the professor the professor at Harvard when he was studying English literature um, Richards, who was a new critic, and um, and his ideas on the poet Coleridge. I mean, that was pretty strong in his PhD, but it seemed to just totally disappear um, after that point. And I wondered whether he had ever ever mentioned that, whether that was some subtext behind um, 
what he was talking about later on as he developed through towards I, I, I never read his thesis. I yeah. have no idea. I don't, I don't know if anybody has, except um, for me now. Well, yeah. I, 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 I've, n- I've never heard this line. And, and as I remember, while he was coming towards the completion of his PhD at, um, at the Bartlett, he was running these seminars. Hannah Arendt um, mm. uh, was a really important, was, was a real hero, hero, hero heroine of his. Yeah. Um, as, as a real ideological perspective, he yeah. took he he did a he did a program as I remember, and this is really dredging it up on Anne R- Rand. Anne Rand, mm-hmm. was that yeah? yeah um, These figures were sort of being battered around. This at the time. this, mm. but but what we're looking here, what we're looking at here, is certainly an ideological perspective on architecture, mm. um, and um, a very powerful ideological perspective. Yeah, and Anne Rand and Hannah Arendt are. Two extreme opposites, you know, a, a, a polemic. If I ever saw one yeah. in, in the making, yeah. So it's not surprising when I, when I, when he starts to talk about radical eclecticism yeah. and Arata Isazaki. I'm seeing it as a, as an ideological uh, proposition, purely ideological proposition. Yeah. As I said, I was very disappointed when it turned out not to be. Yeah. But so it made his name. Yeah, absolutely. And he and became a an architectural superstar. Yeah, absolutely. But, but more importantly, more importantly, it. Um, you know the work, the work that he did and what Venturi had done, suddenly opened up the floodgates for architects to think about another perspective apart from the machine um, age um, canon yep. That, yep. that existed at that time. But I think coming back to this proposition about well, why did uh, this question? Why why did Charlie come to London to do it? Mm. You you do have to un- take into into account here sort of the role of AD. From the early '60s onwards, um, Architectural Design Magazine. From the early '60s onwards, and you need to go back and have a look mm. at uh, at some of those issues because what's what's happening there is they're putting forward alternative uh, ways of thinking about architecture, yep. mm-hmm. um, and you know, really, um, it's a very broad um, and wide net that's being cast mm. um, at uh, throughout that period. Um, begins with the uh, Crosby. Um, goes on to Ken Frampton, really starts to come together with um, with Robin, Robin. Robin, um, uh, Robin Middleton, um, is uh, developed again by Peter Murray, um, and um, excuse me, I'll get that. <laughs> now, th- does regionalism have any part in this, or did that come later? It's much later. So, am, am I so? Am I right to paraphrase you in saying the political aspect of radical eclecticism was something that you were engaged with, but the the language aspect that came into postmodern architecture is something that you're a little bit more reserved about? A little bit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, I was I was trying to be a little. Yeah. So, but no, no. Look, it's 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 it's, it's rubbish. You know, architecture yeah. doesn't work that way. Right. Architecture I, is experienced. It's yeah. not actually yeah. analysed in that way. Yeah. No, I I, I I certainly, and the more I look into it, the more I probably take that point of view. You know, it's a phenomenological um, issue that yeah. we're dealing with, not uh, analytical, yeah. literary analytical issue. So then something that just um, popped into my head, he could, Jenks uh, could well have just proceeded along those political lines and and not introduced this language aspect into his work. W- what was it about um, these language theories that to him was so powerful as a sort of a game changer in, in discourse in architecture. Well, postmodernism was something that was bubbling away in literature. Yeah. Yeah. So it was it was you know, it mm. was in the in the air. Yeah, right. Yeah. And it he it was a hook. Well he he translated it from yep. the literary discourse into the architecture. Yeah, you know, so, you know, Andy Warhol You've got to look at sort of you know the re- the real mainstream of um, pop art, mm. uh, both in um, in America and in New York, but also in um, in Britain mm. at that time. So it you know this these are all threads of uh, of the same piece of cloth mm. that's gradually being woven into something at that yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I I I just go back to um, you know I'm sure this notion of what what London was like in the sixties. Yeah. 
it was so, such a powerful place um, and it was so open to investigations, experimentation, mm. um, not only in architecture and fashion and art and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, it's not surprising that Charlie would have thought, let's go to London and... Um, right, the same way it. we all did. Yeah, that's yeah, right. For we exactly the same there. reason. Right. We all right. ended there because who would want to go to... Um, to Los Angeles or even to New York on that because the, New York had almost expired days. at yeah. that point. Yeah. So and that's where the, the energy was in London. Mm. And mm. it wasn't until it wasn't until Peter Eisman and Ken Frampton sort of, uh, and Andy McNair started to form the uh, Institute of um, Urban Urban Studies. Studies. Yeah. whatever it is in, in New York. Mm. That New York started to get back into the scene mm. again because up until then New York was really it was dead. Yeah, right. And you know what Rem did was pretty important, you know, the, the um, um, delirious New York. Yeah. But we were talking 1970s, about the same period, in fact, mm. Mm. As, Charlie's mm. book, as Charlie's book comes out. Yeah. So there is this series of, if you like, cultural entrepreneurs yeah. at the AA under the ring, ringmastership of Alvin Boyarsky, who himself was the supreme entrepreneur. Right. And they all were forging, uh, they were all recent graduates essentially, and they were all forging their reputations, and they all had stellar, stellar careers, and I'm talking about Rem, later Zaha, Nigel, Coates, Charlie, um, uh, Leo, um, Bernard Chumi, yeah. um, and when you think that they were all in the same institution at the same time, mm. you begin to get quite an interesting culture happening because mm. they weren't mm. all singing from the same hymn oh there was Fred Scott and, um, Fred and, 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 and Robin and Robin Evans, Robin Evans. Evans. Yeah. Um, um, very and then interesting was, people then there was Robin Middleton who ran the general studies who um, was an extraordinary um, uh, scholar yes scholarly figure he was also but at well, the time he was librarian at Cambridge so Cambridge would come down mm. um, Dalibor yeah. Vesely Peter Carl mm. All of these people were um, Joseph Rickwood teaching um, yeah. Kenneth Frampton publishing. Um, it was a very powerful time. Mm. And then there was the American mob, you know, Michael Graves and um, and Bob Eisenman. Stern. How Eisenman. does um, you were talking about ideology? How does Cedric Price and his cybernetics and the cybernetics as a way to make man free and how does that all fit into yeah, absolutely. it? Was there at the I time mean, and well? that is an ideological perspective. But know, it was I mean, seen as something very different from the approach of Jenks to... Uh, yes, but he, d but he was... But don't, do remember that, um, that, that Cedric comes out of the English social democratic mm -hmm. perspective. Mm -hmm. on, and he's a socialist, mm -hmm. fundamentally, yes. and he's looking to a technological um, um, mechanisms for, um, for realising um, this... This, mm. this social vision of his, uh, very ideological, powerful mm. ideological, um, in a in a way that um, that um, that Peter Cook and Archigram were less so. I mean, they were less clear about the ideological propositions. They I were think they were apolitical and much more futurist. But mm. Cedric was political, yeah. but very political. Mm. Mm. But Jenks didn't see his proposal as something that had an ideological connotation or quick no, well you read if you, if you read read um, the, the, mm -hmm. la, the radical eclecticism, mm -hmm. absolutely it is. And if you understand the earlier work that he'd been doing. Yeah. Um, but I is mean, that your reading of him? Or do you think he saw it as something... Is it something no, no, that no, he developed? Here's, here's a person who's running seminars mm -hmm. at the AA. Mm -hmm. You know, juxtaposing Hannah Arendt and mm -hmm. um, and, yes. and and Rand. I mean, this is if this is not ideo ideological. I don't know what is. It's mm -hmm. extreme ide ideology. Yeah. Um, so, what I mean, what what's interesting is that Jenks. Um, I think Jenks led to Anna Arendt, who you know, who he, mm -hmm. he thought was very important. Mm -hmm. um, um, so I don't think he was necessarily taking a, a, a pluralist line. Mm. I, I think it was more a polemic that he was developing. Mm. Yeah. So I'd say that yeah. is ideological. I, yeah. I'd say also implicit, somehow, or implicit, was a left-wing mm. position mm. that all architects yeah. Yeah. had, and probably still had, mm. by and large. And that was certainly a function. I mean, mm. you, just, you just understood that. Would mm. you agree? Making a better world. Yeah, 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 yeah. And certainly, you know, in England at that time, uh, so close to the post-war um, explicit program project, which was to build, mm. build 
schools and mm -hmm. hospitals and housing. Yeah. Um, but think about know. think about think about Covent Garden and the role that Brian Anson and um, and the AA architectural architects played in in just turning the whole of Covent Garden on its head because mm -hmm. it was Covent Garden was to be developed, which was the old vegetable market of London, was to be developed as a as a, a high end um, housing and office. Um, I and think there was to be a sort of freeway through the middle and, of it. And, and decanting, decanting this, uh, this population um, that had been there. Which was decanted. Which was decanted in the end. But I mean, there was an enormous battle. And frankly, that's the beginning, really is the beginning of a, of a, social, a social democratic um, approach to, um, to, I, de I think to development. I that, that think that the alternative movement too, which was extremely strong, was also the main thing. Mm. This, this was the time of Bader Meinhof and all sorts of other happenings mm. and um, the Irish bombings. And, mm. you know, there was the beginning of the Green Movement in Germany. An Oz magazine. An Oz magazine, yes. Mm. Yeah. But AD in the um, um, from what happened in the in the early seventies is that um, the Standard Catalogue Company decided that it needed to cut the cut the the cost of presenting AD, which had been produced as a hot metal uh, operation, um, typeset, properly typeset, and so on, uh, in hot metal, and um, and Peter Murray by then at that point had become the the what like, what what did one like to call them? The, 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 not the deputy editor, but um, um, I'm trying to think. Technical. The technical editor. So whenever you see a technical editor on AD, read editor. And when you see Monica, Monica was the managing. Was, well, it was the managing editor, and, right. and for, although she is presented as the editor, it was actually always the technical editors that uh, that actually ran Did the, the steering, steered the magazine editorially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, and so when Peter Murray took over, um, he he modelled it on Oz mag magazine, basically mm. on the alternative magazines, mm. and. Um, well, it was the way magazines were produced. They were well, now set beginning on daisy to be wheels. And and beginning to be produced. It was completely different from hot metal. So you could produce suddenly. You could produce so a magazine cheaply. So AD AD you know, lost two thirds of its um, its subscribers almost overnight in that first year <laughs> that it changed and became an alternative magazine. But it was uh, but it was produced at such a fraction of the cost of uh, the old hot metal version that. Um, mm. That it, it, you, the editors could put in it whatever they pleased, mm. and that's precisely what they did. And that really does reflect the era that this is now 73, 74. This is the time that Charlie is um, is now in London mm. doing his bit. Yeah, so. was, was he heavily involved with graphic design for and all those sort of micromanaging things, or did he leave that? Absolutely not. Right, mm. just really hands off. Yeah, right, right, right. Well, but he would take he pictures, which. He was. He was taking. Took a lot of slides, which ended up in the book. Yeah, yeah. But Charlie didn't have a designer's bone in his body, as far right. as I could work out. Okay. <laughs> now he wasn't a designer. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he, he he did experiment with um, making um, a garage conversion of somewhere on the east coast of America. Yeah, yeah. Himself, yeah. Which was just. <laughs> yeah, I've <it's> only <laughs> seen pictures. Uh, Embarrassing. Uh, it, apparently, there was a quite a large model made um, a few years ago for the V&A postmodernism exhibition which I didn't see but this one I was talking about earlier right on the east coast mm. 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 yeah okay well, interesting catalogue of that exhibition oh yeah, so yeah. must mm. have a look mm. and, and I'm just, just remembering um, the first architecture Biennale was in 1980 which is a bit later and that was postmodernism. Charlie was ran. Charlie was. The I think Charlie was, was the director of it. Yes. Portuguese mm. yeah. and yeah. Um, it was, it was uh, a street. They made a street in the Arsenali, which was built by the Cina Chitta, the scenographers from the Italian from movie industry. Mm. Mm. And you know there was just it was. And there were maybe a, there were a dozen there were a dozen sort of um, people, each of them having a two-story bay. Mm. Um, which was maybe you know six or seven meters wide and mm. five meters high, mm. if you can imagine. And each one was set up. Um, so Venturi was, was there, you know. Um, yes, I, I suppose that was some sort of um, ap apotheosis of, of a postmodern statement. Yeah. Um, cultural statement. Um, backtracking a little, sure. and with the um, 
that Hannah Arendt comes up a lot. She's often in his texts, and that kind of spirit of revolution, um, not so much. Um, he has he uses this model of revolution uh, where, uh, sort of halfway through the cycle of most revolutions, there's established a whole myriad of different um, institutions that run their own separate things rather than it being resolved into the next thing. Um, and it, it strikes me that in in a political sense, with the the kind of overthrow, if you want, of um, modern architecture for postmodern architecture, that middle piece, which could maybe be this radical eclecticism, gets in a way skipped in favor of the new resolution. Is that? It was easier. Right. It was much easier. Yeah. Uh, and also, you have to remember that at the time, very little building is going on anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it's difficult to find examples. And the, the best example that Charlie could find for us was Gaudi. Right. Yeah. Uh, and we're saying, Charlie, if you're going to make this argument, you've got to actually find some contemporary architects. Right. And, uh, you know, if you look through the book, there aren't any. Right. Beyond hot dog stands. Beyond hot dog stands. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, so, you know, there's a, you know, I think the idea of developing. Um, the ideological argument would have been very, very difficult for him. But on the other hand, he was absolutely enamoured with um, with California and the Madonna Inn and, right. and things like that. You know. Yep. Also, I think he was surfing away at the time mm. uh, in architecture, where architects themselves were champing at the bit, yeah. desperate to to remove themselves and get beyond the sort of orthogon orthogonal straight jacket of, yeah. of modernism yep. they wanted to create a uh, new formal language a new formal language and Charlie um, to a great extent uh, gave them the, the rationale yeah. and he, he not only persuaded them they didn't need much persuading right. but he also validated what, what they were doing yeah. so yeah. he so he sensed the moment was happening anyway, he, and he uh, it's hard to know whether he sensed the moment, but I'm sure it was all part of the moment. Yeah, yeah, you know, and yep. it was, as I say, happening in, in literature, and, yep. and it was interesting things were happening in art. Yep. Um, so it was, you know, he was he was there, and he was able to express it and, and pull yep. it together. I yep. think what's amusing, and I'm looking for it here, Jack, is the um, is the, the honeymoon postcard. Can you just pick that out of there? I think it's the one that's got this San Diego. Yeah. Building. This is his honeymoon. Yes. 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 Kind of, this is, uh, but it, it's interesting because he and Maggie Wright from, you know that Coronado, the hotel that was in. There's yeah, some like it hot. Oh yeah. 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 Well, he goes there for his honeymoon, a one day oh, honeymoon. A one day honeymoon. Yeah. Which. <laughs> which, which, <laughs> which Maggie says is you know sort of uh, dis heavily disguised as a. Architectural historians junk it. <laughs> um, um, but uh, you can see why, what he's interested in at that point. Yeah. Oh, here it is. Yeah, that's it. Uh, Hotel Del Coronado. Dear Hagen Jackie, here we are on a one day honeymoon, likely disguised as a one day trip of architectural research. This late, late, late stick style, and Maggie's written, see what I mean, mm. 1887, built in a year. Average January temperature 64 degrees, July 74 degrees. How here we lie in the strong sun while 10 foot waves um, roll in from your country, meaning Australia, brought by surfers. Um, if it looks like some like it hot, you, then your memory is good. Very Maurian. We saw him yesterday at the wedding, um, something I only had a day in LA. Uh, blah blah, lucky picks. You need a color spread. He's he's saying something to do with the magazine in company. Blah 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 blah. How is the AD issue when Charles and Maggie? I mean, yeah, mm. sort of. But so, but you can see turn it over and you can see exactly what he's interested in. Mm. You know, sort of eclecticism from mm. the late nineteenth century American style, American mm. stick style eclecticism. Which is a wonderful combination of arts and crafts, and uh, along with um, along with sort of Romanesque architecture mm. in the shingle style. Some um, long way from Rainer Banham's interests, mm. right? 
Yeah, oh, yeah, but Raina Bannum is interested in subcultures, true, you true. know. So in California subcultures, you know. Mm. And, and, I mean, so you, when you read um, read the things that he does when he's in California, mm. um, you can see why all these would actually fit together. Mm. So that was Char Charles Moore was at his wedding, is that? Oh, I should think so. Yeah. Were they so close it, friends? It would seem. Well, I think Charlie would have known everyone. I think yeah. Charlie. Yeah. I think Charlie Charles was Moore was, was very. Was, was very friendly, was very was social. But, also but they got married in. LA. In the US. Yeah. yeah, I'd forgotten that, but there you go. Hmm. In Most LA, it doesn't lie. Mm. Well, <laughs> he was teaching at. Um, where was he teaching, Jane? Uh, I Somewhere don't in know. California. Where, um, it, but you, it, University it may, of Southern uh, uh, California, uh, uh, UCLA, I think. But um, I would. That was only a guess, and you'd have to go yeah. and do a bit of research. Yeah, I think. I think he might. Be. But talk to Britt Anderson because Britt. Britt, uh, Britt, will know. Britt was teaching with Peter at about the same time. No, in the three years later, um, after pub, language of postmodern. Uh, modernism was published, but she was teaching in, in the same program, right. and he was there at that time. Right. Yeah. He he's from the from the east coast, yes. isn't he? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's one for, he but writes for well, me. But that may well have been, you know, uh, 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 as a result of um, working for Bannum. Right. Yeah. Um, he's writing here from the Hotel Algonquin in October '77. Dear Jackie, just arrived. Here after a double standby, first Air India, which was full, then Air Iran, which was full of Iranians. <laughs> Finish my manuscript with um, countings, I think, etc. So it will be ready to roll when I get back. Hope you have written for all the pics. He must be talking about. October 77, no, yes, that's, that's, it's that's language post -modern uh, well it was published before then, mm. anyway, since I'm staying in this posh hotel surrounded by literary luminaries, I've decided the rich something life is for me <laughs> I think he and, 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 and he married well and certainly <laughs> 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 worked for him so anyway, there you go um, yes uh, he. W I don't know what he can I say one thing though about, uh, I would la hate you to get the idea that we don't admire and love him <laughs> because mm. we do. Yeah. And and what's more, when when I when when I finally fell out with Papadakis and and uh, left AD, um, it was over a photograph that um, that uh, that Charlie had supplied for an issue with uh, John Alberti with Joseph Rickworth. Which was uh, Charles. Charles was completely innocent. Charles was the innocent party in all mm. this. Yes, and um, and it was hideous, typical bit of. Charlie's sort of bad photographs, but we left, and and Charlie, um, we and we set up International Architect, and we needed money, and um, we got ten thousand dollars from um, Philip Johnson. From Philip Johnson, and um, and we got two thousand pounds, I think, from um, from Charlie and Maggie, mm. on the condition that we didn't tell anyone. Mm. So you're probably the first person mm. we've told. We're told, yeah. But I mean, you know, they were really the nicest most supportive people yeah. always were mm. and when does Maggie die um, we were in Australia by then uh, so that's must mean in the late 80s late 80s oh. later 80s or the 90s I don't know so they were married when was that postcard oh, 78 maybe 77 something yeah. like that so 10 years they had or at least at least yeah. and I think maybe more and I think and if you go on to that uh, that trust that Charlie set up, you'd get a better perspective Maggie's, of that. Maggie's prose. Mm -hmm. So the garden that was built in Scotland comes after? Well, in fact, I think um, they were doing a lot in Scotland before Maggie died. Um, whether he'd completed that garden, I, I couldn't say. I think he did the garden after she died. Mm. Well, it was a memorial to her. Yes, mm -hmm. and it was her... I mean, it was like the family well, seat. Well, Maggie had done a book on Chinese gardens, so she was very into landscape architecture. Mm. Mm, it's very and of course, there was a m bizarre and remarkable house that they lived in in Chelsea. In mm. Holland, Park. Holland, Holland, Park, Holland Park. Was it? Which yeah. was done by John Corrigan, if I'm not mistaken. No, it was done by, um, with Charlie and Charlie um, working with... Um, um, after he, um, yeah, colon he colonised um, the, the, the high-tech architect. Oh, I've just forgotten his name, but um, yes. Yeah, Grimshaw, uh, not yep. the other half, half of Grimshaw. Farrell. Yes. Farrell. Terry Farrell. Terry Farrell. He colonised Terry Farrell and turned him into a postmodern architect. 
and they built and they did that. They did that together. Well, John Corrigan, who worked with Sterling and then worked with me in Bernard Hartley's office, he did something from Aggie, and I've just uh, it was an apartment fit out of, of some sort, and that would have been in oh, 75. Well, they did have an apartment before they built the house, mm. which included uh, an extraordinary sort of trompe l'oeil corridor with a portrait of Maggie. <laughs> looking um, around the corner. Looking around the corner. <laughs> it was very well done, and um, that was a it was a lovely, big, spacious apartment, and that could have been in Chelsea. That was in Chelsea. Mm. Um, so he could have. That could have been what he. Charlie did. had enormous energy, mm. and um, and I, you know, he, he just kept running all the while. And I thought I was pretty, pretty high energy myself, but he was better than me. And I was talking to him about this one day, and he said, "Oh, it was easy." He said, um, I get up in the morning and I do a day's work and then at um, about three o'clock I, uh, I go and sleep for two hours and then I have a shower and I start my next day. Mm. Okay. So he, he has, he, he always, I, said, I always put two days into any day. Mm. That was his, that oh. was his solution. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, sort of um, Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> what else am I interested in? Um... Uh, yeah, well, I was saying before, um, it's probably a bit of a long shot, but the, the Richards connection, the new critic connection is one thing, but another strand that I'm really interested in, as well as Bannum, is um, Levi Strauss, who comes out a lot in his Levi Strauss? Work. Yeah. Everyone was into Levi Strauss. Yeah, that's then. exactly I mean, what you know, I thought. it was on every curriculum. Yeah. So... So did that, I mean... You should speak to Ivor and Dick in Sydney, if you want to talk, if you want to sort of deal with linguistics and yeah. um, postmodernism. He's a he's a literary um, professor of literature. Right. And, and also a magazine. And, and, and a magazine publisher, Heat, and uh, he's just started the Sydney uh, Sydney Review of Books. Right. Okay. But and he was a friend of ours right. in London at the time, he yep. and his wife Evelyn. He was doing his um, But he'd tell you all he about He did his doctorate under Steiner. George Steiner, mm -hmm. and um, at Cambridge. At Cambridge, but, but but he. Evelyn did hers under Germaine Greer at Cambridge. Mm -hmm. So, so. And then he went to work in Geneva for. Did he come? The other postmodernist, the three three person. Mm. Mm. They come in the war. Um, so, if you want to understand a bit more about the the literary side of mm. of that, you would. We really would be wise to speak to Ivor Indic. Yeah, He's a professor of um, Australian literature at uh, the University of Western Sydney. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely interested in that, um, but I'm also interested in this the, the fact that it was popular and it was such a phenomenon at the time and how um, that kind of um, popularity feeds into its power or lack of power, um, depending on where in the cycle of popularity it is. Do you know what I mean? So, f for example... Uh, um, it it figured a lot in um, Jenks's PhD, but it became less um, strongly uh, visible the further he went through. And yeah. so, I'm, I suppose I'm wondering whether he continued talking through that language and those kinds of concepts, and he didn't write through them, or whether it was just a kind of a something that passed into something else. My impression of the time was that it was something that the French intellectuals really hung on to, mm. probably a lot longer than the Anglo-Saxons. Um, you know, this sort of, what's that joke? Um, uh, it's great in practice, but will it work in theory? <laughs> I French mean, there's problem. a sort of... <laughs> That's the French problem. The, you know, the Anglo-Saxon and, and the Latin... <laughs> this sort of the cleavage dichotomy. between yeah. theory and Charlie really was not working in a in a Latin milieu yeah. culture. He was right. he was working out of an Anglo Saxon. Yep. And you know, he comes he comes to it, you know, as an Anglo Saxon. Yeah. So it's uh, you know, he, he's as as um, um <laughs> I keep losing me, names. Me because you know, we've, 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 we've been you doing get to this a certain age, and Bob will tell you this is true. I hope <laughs> that you just forget things. Yeah. Um, but as um, as as Roy Landau 
got it down. <laughs> Makes the point about um, about the Anglo-Saxon tradition is is fundamentally empiricist. We talked about this last yeah. time, yeah. and uh, and the French Romance, uh, the Italian Romance language um, is, uh, is 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 rationalist, yeah. and therefore theoretical. If theory is proposed, as Jackie says, you know, yeah. um, in this back to front sort of way, you know, you work proceed from theory into practice, mm -hmm. whereas the Anglo-Saxons, if they do theorise, proceed from practice to theory. Mm -hmm. And Charlie, of course, is part of this milieu, and yeah. what's more, I mean, it's a cultural, it's a cultural way of thinking, yeah. and what's more, you know, the fact that Charlie falls into the, the easy trap of, um, of cataloguing and categorising mm -hmm. um, is... Um, it is it another, it's just naming. It yeah. It's naming, and it doesn't, doesn't analyse at all, you see, and, yeah. he doesn't theor and in the end, he ceases theorising. Yeah. And, uh, in fact, he doesn't theorise, really theorise, he makes a, 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 a hypothesis of sorts yeah. in, the, in the language of postmodern architecture, and then abandons it, yeah. and abandons it for, um, for, for this catalogue. Yeah. Yep. cataloging system yeah and that's really part of an empirical way of thinking yep. you know it's easier to analyze without actually analyzing yeah yeah but this Claude very levi strauss true. things a thing i i studied communications which mm. was a very new i was the second year mm. you know, in london at the time mm -hmm. and of course you know this is on the curriculum and the the french uh, public intellectuals were translated into english and writers like Roland Barthes. Roland Barthes, yeah. you know, in mythologies. Yeah. Mythologies was, that was a that book that everybody read. That took yeah. us by storm. Mm. And it's, it's quite conspicuous in its absence um, in Jenks' actual writings. Mm. Um, yes. Although, it's but of course you can see the way mythologies absolutely. absolutely informs his whole perspective. Absolutely. But, but mythologies yeah. is, is, is essentially and basically uh, a question of critical interpretation. Yeah. Charlie doesn't do that. And Charlie won't do it. Yeah. Yeah. So mm. you know you. And you know, and if you go to ad hocism and you look at the tough, the, the tough analytical work in ad hocism, I'm sure that's George Beard. Right. Right. Yeah. Not Incidentally, Charlie. if you want to look at a, a, a public intellectual, I mean, I'm thinking of either again. Yeah. Uh, you can go onto the website and you can read his his recent essay on um, the guy who wrote Eucalyptus. Murray Bale. Murray Bale. Bale. But, yeah. but uh, everything Ivor does is intensely analytic yeah. and interpretive. Mm. I mean, you know, he'll interpret tea leaves, anything. <laughs> but he can give you a very good... He's worth speaking to because he'll give you a perspective of the literary scene mm. in the early 1970s when yeah. he was doing his doctorate. And yeah. he's... Uh, I mean, what's interesting about Ivor is that he is the first of that group of literary theorists that actually proposes that there are many interpretations to a text, not a single correct one. Yep. And that was a, I mm. mean, that was his. That was a whole. That was a revelation. That, that was a revelation, and that was the center days. point. Of, that was the center point of his, um, of his doctorate, um, which he did on Pamela or something like that. Mm. Um, and um, and it was absolutely new ground because up until then, all literary critics had been trying to find the author's true intent. Yeah and fail to understand, as we now do, and of course Charlie trades on this, is, um, um, is that uh, you know, each, each of us makes a new construction of the text, yeah, yeah. whether it's architecture or whether it's a piece of literature. Yeah. And this yeah. is how meaning, and yeah. this is, how meaning is generated. So, this, so, so when Charlie starts this, these ideas are now beginning to float around mm, yeah, about, okay. about where, meaning, where meaning resides. Right. Mm. So th there was, the, for example, there was no direct. They were translating the books, but Bart's didn't come over, or there was no. Um, there was still a strict division in a sense, and perhaps even when the Anglo-Saxon people were reading the French, there was still a kind of an outsider's perspective or a difference there that they traded off. Do you think, or do you see what I'm saying? Well, I'm, I'm not not quite sure what you're saying, but. Mm. Um, I'm just thinking of the AA, and the French did come over. They did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, not in droves. No, I don't remember Roland Barthes. <laughs> no, no, no. But but the certainly the architects came over. Right. But there tends to be a, a lag, doesn't there, between things being translated and being available? In Probably there wouldn't have been that much of a lag. I mean, May '68, France was on the it map. Could have been mm. four or five years, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. For sure. Mm. Mm. But, we, but everybody was reading Jeffrey Bateson. 
and um, Gregory Bates. Gregory Bates. Gregory Bates. Uh, which and the book was called. Um, um, and an Steps to an Ecology of Mind. mind yes. Mm. Um, I mean, it was a very, very rich period. I mean, who was yeah. the, who was the, the, the interesting Jesuit um, deschooling society? Illich. Yeah, Ivan Illich. Oh, yeah. Illich um, and and he he sort of was not only left wing but also part of the environmental. Um, I don't know that we had an environmental movement at that at that point. It was a mm. there was John T John Turner discourse. John Turner looking at the looking at the um, um, you know the, the favelas and mm. favelas yeah. in South America yeah. and, and and trying to extrapolate from that to mm. a, an, an approach to social housing. Yeah. Um, you know the, the 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 absolute richness of that moment. Yeah. I mean, you have no idea. You, yeah. you know, we do not live in in, that, in those moments anymore. Mm. Um, and so Charlie is uh, is is in the middle of it, this this fantastic soup that's uh, yeah. that's being boiled up. So uh, and collaborations with Silver and Baird that you're talking about. Um, if, were they? I mean. Did he have great relationships with them, or they were just in the same milieu and they mixed, or was it...? Uh, well, George yeah. Baird was a Canadian, yeah. so George did come to, to London, and then yeah. I can remember him lecturing and perhaps teaching at the AA. Yeah. And, and I remember, think George was the intellectual. Yes, right. and do remember that, uh, that uh, Elvin Boyarski is a Canadian. Right. Okay. And Nathan lived in London... And Nathan was an American or a Canadian? I can never quite An American, yeah. I think. And Nathan was a bit of a gadfly. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he was a man about town, very okay. stylish, and. But it, but like Jeffrey. Would Borbett, have gone to nightclubs, I'm sure. But, but like <laughs> Je Nathan Silver and Jeffrey Borbett had had both of them had a, an absolute um, facility for um, for drawing together the many strands of a, of, a, of of various positions and, and expressing and, a, a, and a sort of a popular oh yeah. in a popular accessible way, way. right both, and these were they were both very good at this yes yes i don't i don't think nathan was the i don't think nathan was an academic put it right. that way yeah but he knew how to draw those strands together and present them and yes and and to to show provocative and um, interesting uh, conjunctions of mm. objects and mm that together mm -hmm. you know, you know sort of the you know surrealist exhibition um, was on at the Haywood mm. right about this time right you know, and um, so and that was big and that was yeah. really big um, yeah. so you can see where this notions of ad hocism and all that are all coming together yeah yeah I mean you know Ram Coolhaus is writing about um, about um, about these chance conjunctions that he recognises through um, through Dali and um, mm. yeah. surrealist um, propositions, and uh, and is seeing this actually as an, as a mechanism by which Manhattanism can exist mm. yeah. and thrive. Yeah. And and the idea of the grid promoting mm. anarchy. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, really and bear in mind, we're we're having the, the 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 six or eight of us are having dinner nearly every week. Mm. For about two or three years, at around this period, mm. so you know, uh, you know, this this is what we talked about. I, I mean, I can't remember. <laughs> it was a long while ago, but yeah. this, you know, well, obviously this these what conversations were not. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, this is that's where the conversations led to. Yeah. So where does that hockism come in? I mean, who was promoting that? Charlie, Charlie, and and uh, and and, um, and 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 George. But after. No, before, before it, it yeah. precedes. It, it's a book that precedes uh, mm. postmodernism. Uh, the better work was done in the period that you're interested in. Yeah, without a doubt, the better work was done. That's <laughs> that's one of the reasons why I'm wanting to push it, mm. because I think it's a it's a shame that that is um, undervalued at the expense of the thing that's not as good. Well, yes, but do, but do bear in mind it was uh, it was the catalyst that just. Um, it pulled the stopper out of architecture and allowed them to actually explore. Mm. Um, and postmodernism only survived as an architectural idea for about seven or eight years. Right. And then it was gone. You know? yeah. And then it was briefly replaced by an even worse idea called deconstructivism. Right. And now, you know, most architecture, most architecture has shifted across into some sort of phenomenological exploration. Mm. You know, the experience of space and the experience of materials. Well, and de so on. Deconstruction was an exhibition 
in New York of Mama, I think, and it was posed in direct contradiction to the constructivists. Contradiction. Con contradistinction to the constructivists of the of the early 20th Three. century. Mm. And that was on the behaviors about that time. Was it? Mm. Did it come to mm. London? I it suppose did. it must have forgotten. The Russian came out. Mm. Oh, the constructivist did. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so I the remember Tatman's Tower. And, yes. and mm, yeah. But but the in, in the Mama exhibition, I don't. No, I, I don't. No, I, I don't didn't think see that, it. But, but it put together all sorts of people who wouldn't normally. Mm. Uh, I mean, it was Rem. It was Zaha. It was Martha Clark. Did you say that's right? Did that? Sorry, Gordon Martha Clark. Did you say that that as well? I, I don't remember. But there were about okay. six or seven of them. I think Gary was one. Mm. Um, and, you know, you wouldn't, you'd say, okay, that would be interesting to put them in an exhibition, but you wouldn't yeah. call them a group. Yeah, and yeah. in fact, they all said afterwards, well, we're not part of a movement. Right. Deconstruction is not a movement. Yeah. And we're not part of it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's um, not a theory either. Yeah. But, but of course, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a descriptor, if you yeah. like, that was latched onto. Yeah. And then if ever there was a practice in search of a theory yeah. then that uh, <laughs> but I but I think it also reflects the shallowness 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 of uh, of American theoretical approaches right yeah it's, I think the American theory is pretty thin yeah well I think no in, in in fairness I think that the curators of the exhibition I think it included Philip Johnson um, he wrote his finger in every pie in that space. Yes, but I think that they were interested in showing how architects of that moment were consciously, probably, using formalist devices yeah. that mm. came out of constructivism. Yeah. And, you know, and you could say that that hasn't stopped, that mm. that still goes on. I mean, mm. I think you could scratch an architect today, many architects, and find a constructivist, um, you know, no, no. Well, sinew. Mm. Well, this is the point that Rem always made, was um, you know, their great work, the great proposition of modernism that had not been developed was not formal but programmatic. Mm. Mm. And, uh, and, uh, that, and he chose an architecture of the 1950s because it had been emptied of any significance. It was he, he tried to. He, he picked yeah. Wallace... He, he, Harris, 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 uh, and, and and sort of kidney-shaped forms and so on, yeah. because these had been emptied of any significance, yeah. any ideological or um, formal significance. Yeah. Nobody wanted to make architecture like that, yeah. and so he could use it to talk about programmatic ideas. Yeah. But lo and behold, uh, lo and behold <laughs> <laughs> it was the formalist <laughs> message that. Moves. And of course, yeah. and it happens just at the moment when Charlie says, "You can do this. Yeah. You're allowed to do this." Yeah, yeah. Mm. I think. Rem said at the time, I seem to remember, Charlie was one of the most, imp and they were great friends, probably yeah. still are, mm. and Charles was one of the most important intellects for, for him. Mm. Um, so this is, you know, Rem talking. Yeah. Um, it, I, I don't know whether you... It's worth pursuing. Yeah. They never collaborated on anything, but certainly they were influential on each other. Mm. So, what are the what are the good examples of postmodernism that actually came out of this theory as buildings? Oh, well, famously, I suppose the Michael Graves buildings, mm. um, which then Peter Davidson completely deconstructed in terms of um, an analysis. What about um, Rossi? Rossi, yes, he was he was deemed postmodern. Well, what's but what's interesting? The Italian rationalists. Mm. The Italian rationalists were interested, and Rossi particularly was interested in um, in finding a, a purist language mm. for mm. architecture, mm. A, a formal, formal. A, a purist mm. forms, and uh, and in this way is um, carries on in a direct lineage from uh, um, in one respect from Le Corbusier and Eisenfeld, yeah. you know, and mm. their attempts to establish uh, a purist form, formal language for architecture. What's interesting about Rossi is that Rossi actually introduces to it. Um, the, an Italian sort mm. of slant, which is to do with the typological analysis, mm. Mm. and, and um, if you had come from the Venetian school, mm. then you would have um, you, your typology would have been based on historical 
precedent. Mm. But um, as much as, as Bruno, um, Minardi? Uh, no, 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 uh, I'm talking about the French now. The French actually, in their work on mm. um, typology, was based on historical precedent. And mm. D. Huet. D Huet, that's the University of Huet. Deep analysis of um, of um, of uh, program of program and the way program alters type. Mm. Um, whereas um, if you and uh, whereas if you came from Rome, it was um, a, a more poetic. Mm. Is the easiest way to put it. Mm. And of course, Rossi is uh, Rossi's um, approach to it was to look at the typologies of um, of um, of, um, of fundamental forms that mm. uh, that. Uh, that are part of his mm. ch childhood experience, of his formative experience, mm. the coffee pot, the you know, the beach umbrella, and the, mm. the, the, these various things. So there is Rossi doing that. I think the coffee pot was something that he was subsequently commissioned to do. By no, 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 no. He talks no, on the contrary. He talks about the form of the coffee pot as being as being one of oh, those. Okay. Maybe one this of those is what gave Alessi the idea yeah. in the first place. Well, I think probably it did. But anyway, um, but what um, um, the, so there's Rossi. Looking at those things, who, who was the other person that you mentioned? No, oh, no. Um, no, I was talking about another uh, Italian nationalist. Um, I'm thinking. Um, Portuguese? No, no, no. We're talking about uh, these these uh, this, this formless language that uh, that was happening at the time. Oh yes, Michael Graves. Graves yeah. Michael Graves is uh, Michael Graves um, comes to it from a very interesting position. He comes as a as part of the part of that white architecture, the way the Americans received. Abuse in purism mm. um, in the 1960s and 70s mm. at Hayek and um, and and uh, Meyer and Eisenman and, mm. and, uh, and uh, Guatney and Siegel, there's a whole group of them yeah. um, who are you know who did a phantom who served a phantom apprenticeship as young architects to the purist uh, Abusian period yeah. and uh, and what happens is <laughs> very amusing is that Leo Creer goes to Princeton, where Michael Graves is also teaching. Mm. And Michael Graves and Leo Creer do a studio together. Mm. And this is the most bizarre... <laughs> who dance could, partner. Who, who, <laughs> could ever, who, who could ever actually get a dance ticket like this together is beyond me. Mm. Because, uh, because Leo is really deeply committed to a, a, a European socialist, social, mm. socialist view about the reconstruction of the Euro traditional European pre-industrial city mm -hmm. and uh, and and the two of them get it off I mean, it's just mm. bizarre and <laughs> and and as a consequence um, Michael Graves Michael Graves does um, <laughs> does this project um, mm. um, which is uh, which is the uh, New the Haven uh, Wildlife Centre no 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 the New Jersey uh, Wildlife Centre New Jersey and um, and when you a and it's, it's quite bizarre because um it, you can see it's absolutely career esque in its, um, in its, you know, mm. it's an absolute mm. abandonment of, um, of, um, of, Corb. Of, of Corb and uh, and sort of uh, an attempt to to make a career esque architecture. What it was, what is very amusing, of course, is from an American perspective, as a an American pragmatism towards um, technology, is that um, that uh, that all the career esque details, I mean, these trusses and things like that, are false. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, you know you can see how you can see how the wall spreads out here to take the thrust of the of the truss on the outside mm. here. Well, you know Peter Davidson does a very nice analysis because we got hold of the working drawings from from Michael and um, and you can see they're just they're just tacked on. <laughs> yeah. They're not they're not actually resolving any thrust at all. So we what we're seeing here is um, is Creer and um, and Graves. And I think Graves, empowered by postmodernism, mm. is starting to think about another language for architecture, yeah. a, a new formal language for architecture. Mm. But, but it's this not is functional. Uh, no, no, no. It's, 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 this is it's about symbolic. Well, you know, I think what what uh, what Michael very was American. what Michael was very interested in yeah. was trying to express this sort of um, some sort of um, traditional structural expressionism. Mm. Well, uh, in that sense, it is. And it, which, and it, it, is it, it succeeds, but it's yeah. just like uh, like a cinecitta. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Scenography. Yeah. It's a novelty, that's yeah. all. Mm. Um, it's, yeah, that idea of pragmatic rather than idealistic and formal rather than some other combination. Well, again, of it's, if you like, it's the Anglo Saxon, yeah. you know, the Latin. Yeah. Obviously, Michael Graves is working from an Anglo Saxon. Mm. So I, w I went to. Um, I mean, this is the Venturi at about the same time. Mm -hmm. This is the House of Venturi's, and I was I was talking to Venturi about um, 
about doing a house, uh, went to his office, spent the morning with him, and uh, and he, yes, he said, why didn't I do this house in Delaware that he'd just done, which is you know, and it's quite an interesting, quite an interesting house because it has um, ideas about perspective and so on in it, which are particular to what Venturi was abstracting at the time, mm. so a, a, a different sort of purism on, mm. on his part. Um, and um, but when I and he said, well, go and talk to the, the job architect, and he'll organise the drawings for you. So I sit down with the job architect, and I open up the drawings. He unrolls the drawing for me, and I immediately see that it's not actually a piece of um, Georgian architecture of um, reproduced mm. in the in the twentieth century. But uh, but in fact, inside um, this well, apparently timber building, um, Cape Cod sort of style timber building, is um, is a steel frame. Mm. Um, and um, and I said. What's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I was sh- absolutely shocked yeah. from my fearless point of view, yeah. and, uh, and being sort of English, that English sort of background, um, absolutely shocked. And uh, and he said, "Oh well, the builder just said that we could have all the details, all the corners and all the mouldings, mm. but it'd be much easier for him if he did it with a steel frame. But he'd mm. cover it all up with all the mouldings, and that's the way it is. Mm. American America never produced a high tech architect for this reason, mm. I mean, mm. because they're pragmatic. Mm. And uh, I'm saying these things because this is. This is the cultural milieu that Charlie comes out of. Yeah. So you have to be really very careful about um, you know, seeing Charlie as, um, as promulgating a, 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 a developed theoretical position. Yeah. No. I don't, I you think I, I don't think, I think it's impossible for him. He's more representative of his background than of that. Of his background yeah. in that respect. Mm-hmm. Um, not to say that the back, that, that time wasn't incredibly exciting. Yeah. You know. No. Yep. Absolutely. But, um, ben, what about... Ben? How did people relate to Venturi, especially um, around those dinner tables? Was he, was he someone that that still had currency and like powerful yeah, currency? Yeah. Hero. He was he was a hero, yeah. not only because of the books he wrote. Mm. And he and Denise Scott Brown came and um, well, lectured at the AA regularly. Do mm. remember though? And that Denise was the sister-in-law of Robin Middleton. Mm-hmm. Not that. There was any nepotism well, there's going there's on. There were South Africans, but, yeah. right. there but, but there were everybody knew everybody else, was, and there were yes, connections and yeah. so on. Right. It's not surprising. Yeah, but uh, but uh, Venturi was um, was really very important. Yeah. I mean, in a way that we can't imagine now. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it was really very significant. If well, Rex Addison had that book, for instance, Learning from Las Vegas, that mm-hmm. not too many people had it in Australia. But you know, he yeah. took it very seriously, and I inherited it from him. And it was all tied up in, you know, that regional interest that we had in looking at, well, what did this country have to offer in terms of inspiration for a regionalist mm. approach? Mm. And it was very much to do with the way that Venturi was looking at what he was looking at. Mm. Now, there are two things you need to remember here. Venturi was trained at, um, um, in um, Philadelphia. Mm. And uh, the, f- the school in Philadelphia was, uh, and I remember Venturi sitting and talking to me about this, that the school that was still a Beaux Arts school when he was there, and it was under um, his name will come to me in a while. Cret. Cret, yes, Cret. Mm. Uh, the, the American. <laughs> Paul Cret. Paul Cret, yes. He was the American. He was the dean. C R E T. And so Venturi comes out of, um, to begin with, comes out of. Um, a Beaux Arts tradition, and secondly, he can remember as a as a as a, before he started architecture, going to the library and looking at at, um, at English luncheons. Luncheons, looking at luncheons. Mm. I mean, being thinking this is what architecture is about. Right, that's yeah. like his his um, fairy godfather. So, that's so, that, so second, Luchens. secondly, uh, you know, Philadelphia um, East Coast um, nineteen. 1940s, mm. late 1940s. You know, this was very. This was like Princeton. Yeah. You know, this is very sophisticated, scholarly. You know, um, I think rigorous education that yeah. he had. So, secondly, his his wife and partner is Denise Scott Brown, and they're trained in South Africa. And the South Africans use an Eng- uh, a part come out of an English tradition, mm. and and there and she's a scholar. Mm. He's primarily a scholar, yeah. so that so all that work that um, that Venturi does um, from um, in, in learning from Las Vegas, which of course follows um, 
complexity on contradiction. Yes, complexity mm. on complexity contradiction. contradiction under view from the Cappadelia. Um, all that work is has a has a type of analytical scholarship to it, yeah. which um, which I think is is her contribution yeah. to yep. that. Mm. Um, but I, but of course, you know, with the you know, his work that he does when he goes to Rome, mm. and it's a shocking experience for him when he goes as a Rome scholar, um, and to the American Academy in Rome mm. um, in the early sixties, mm. mid mid sixties. It's a shocking experience to um, to have to deal with um, um, this historical tradition that's around him, yeah. and and to try and actually make sense of that yeah. for, as a modernist. And yeah. so he begins to do that. And in this respect, you know, he's um, far more important. Than uh, for architects yeah. in dealing with the language uh, with postmodern architecture yeah. than than Charlie is. It, he even um, another similarity between them is um, uh, Venturi's use of ambiguity, um, which is the literary thing from that he gets from another new critic, um, Empson. So that's I suppose I I have an underlying question that I'd like to ask Charles if I ever get to. Is um, it, it's almost like he idolized Venturi the way that he processed his whole kind of theoretical base using that kind of new critic um, literary techniques and literary concepts and pushing that through architecture and how you know the, the question is sort of was he aware of that how how early on did he try and push that or would he ever admit to that? Well, be warned, if you do get to have this interview with Charlie, he may not tell you the truth. I, <laughs> well, he might not remember, too. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm scratching my head, literally, yeah. trying to remember. But what was it Venturi was up there yeah. with a yes. career with, with books, with pieces of architecture that had a sort of, um, well, preceded him. I mean, he was a much older figure than Jenks. Yeah. Jenks was still... Mm. Well, it's mm. Jenks of our age, yeah. yeah. So there's there's a difference there, mm. and you know when Jenks goes off to the British School, that's a Lutchins building, you know, and then he kind of absorbs all that with Baroque and what's the going on Mary around Mary him, Mary him. Yeah. and you know it's a pretty big learning curve that he's going through. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but out of that came a pretty sophisticated practice. And, uh, well, of course, and, and do understand also the American Academy. I went there for. Um, I was invited to go and have lunch. We were invited to have lunch there one day, and um, lunch at the American Academy was done out in a, under a loggia, uh, and there would have been forty people um, at this lunch along a long table. Mm. And this was lunch every day, wow. and um, and uh, and there were at the at the American Academy were. Scholars, intellectuals from every every possible discipline, They're all sitting around the table at lunchtime. Every lunch, this was what so, you did. So you know, yeah. there'd have been archaeologists it's and it's musicologists yeah. and artists it's, and uh, you know philosophers. It, everything would have been incredibly there. rich. So yeah. so you know, I think um, I think that um, certainly Venturi would have been in this very different milieu. Yeah, and, and, and so mm. I think you know, I'm sure that. Um, Literary criticism that you keep making a reference to, which I don't know anything about, mm -hmm. but, 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 I, but I will. Yeah. But I'm sure that more. I'm sure your right will probably inform Charlie. Yeah. Um, and the question is, how did he find Bannon? Yeah. That's probably more important. That's that's right. Yeah. Um, because, um, but it, that may simply have been, you know, it was much more interesting to do this in England because that's where Spring in London and Oxford Road event was happening. Right. And you know, and Bannon was, um, you know, was was the one. Practical scholar choice. that you could go and do a yeah. do a do a decent PhD under in yeah. architecture yeah. that would take him yeah. yeah yeah so it may just have been practical practical yeah mm. well this is this is pretty interesting genealogy of postmodernism but it includes a whole lot of stuff that I didn't know is that Charlie's um oh yes it's my Charlie mm. yes where are we here? Genealogy. It's got Disneyland and it's also got the Sydney Opera House and yep. it's got Sarum in. <coughs> and Hockis. Stern. Oh, well, he's dealing with expressionist architecture. Quasi postmodern. Uh, did he, ever, did he ever say that? Interesting. In, in, that, in, those, in those many words. In that many words. Expressionist, yeah. oh, yeah. expressionist architecture is one which is actually not rooted in the canon. Yeah, that's right. So I mean, he was so fascinated by these. Uh, he, for him, that was the, that was the easiest, easiest yeah. way to go. Yeah. Mm. 
so it, yeah, it, that's yeah. right. I mean, I think this probably and what's wasn't more, the only one to make sense of expression of darker texture, you immediately start to interpret it. Mm. You know, so you give several examples. So they loved the opera art because it was open to so many different yeah. interpretations. Made in Turtle, you name it, nuns, yeah. habits, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sails. 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 Yeah. Sails. Oh, that's a different. But so Saren and all the others you know, who are making it, they're making expression of darker texture. Um, you know, they're you know they're the ones that are most open to interpretation. Mm. Mm. So you can see why it um, he latched onto it. Look, he's uh, look. I think his understanding of architecture at that time was relatively simple, but you can you get a sense of his his increasing sophistication by the time he gets around to doing the book on um, the project of Europe, project on Philip Woods or the yeah, project yeah. view of architecture mm. which I think is one of those r really a, a fabulous piece of psychological yeah. scholarship yeah yeah it's really anybody else does it does it pale by comparison yeah yeah Why well, are you looking like that? No, no, I was wondering the next the question. <laughs> <laughs> what yeah. was the next question we're going to be <laughs> I don't know if I have any more questions. Yes, look, we can't be a lot of help to you, I'm sorry. No, you've been a, a lot of help. I, I, I wish I had more questions. But as I say, a, a lot of my work is based more on the text themselves, so this kind of background and biographical stuff is really useful to give the kind of context. Um, uh, but yeah primarily the stuff that I have to find is is there to be read so you know McLuhan everybody read McLuhan mm. yep. everybody read McLuhan yep. mm. I yep. mean that's right and uh, and uh, so the types of questions that um, that uh, that Charlie raises about uh, about where meaning comes from mm. Mm. you know was uh, was a uh, and uh, were being asked by other intellectuals at the time yep. and and everybody was aware of them yeah everybody was aware of them we i mean charlie was considered to be a bit of an extremist but um and and a, and also a bit of a joke in some respects mm -hmm. um particularly by the likes of martin Pauli and others um because what charlie one of the things that charlie had latched on to was the power of fetishism yeah the, the transference of meaning yeah yeah uh, of, sig of significance yeah yeah Yes, 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 you know, shoes, sexy shoes. Yeah. Was it was, was reduced to this? <laughs> it was reduced to. Mm. Mm. Anyway. That's it. Okay, thank you.